Welcome to the Happier and Healthier Podcast. I'm your host, Maria Marlowe, and this is a place where we don't rely on good luck or good genes for our health and happiness, but rather we create it with our thoughts and our actions each and every single day. Each week, I'll bring you a thought or a guest that will help you live your happiest and healthiest life. Are you ready? Welcome to the Happier and Healthier Podcast. Today's guest is Marta Zaraska, a Canadian science journalist and the author of Growing Young, How Friendship, Optimism, and Kindness Can Help You Live to 100. When I first saw Marta's book on Instagram and read the title, I knew right away that I wanted to have her on the show. If you guys have been listening for a while, you know that as much as I love food and fitness and these things are super important, I have become more and more interested in the mental side of things and our perspective, our happiness, our mindset. And so I'm really excited to have Marta on the show to share a little bit of the science and research behind why friendship, relationships, optimism, and kindness can dramatically improve our health. If you're in the market for an air purifier, your search stops here. While most air purifiers on the market utilize a HEPA filter, the truth is a DFS or disinfection filtration system is 40 times more effective than a HEPA filter. A DFS filter is able to capture much smaller particles, including microbes like bacteria and viruses. They're used in hospitals, planes, and other public places because they're the most effective air filters available. And now they're even available for your home and the good news is they're small and discreet and affordable. Head to intellipure.com and use the code HAPPIER for 10% off. Marta, thanks so much for being here. Thank you so much for inviting me, Maria. So typically when we think about health and longevity books, we're thinking about nutrition and fitness, but your book is about optimism and kindness and friendship. So can you just give us a little bit of a backstory? What inspired you to write Growing Young, How Friendship, Optimism, and Kindness Can Help You Live to 100? So I've been a science journalist for a while now. I've been writing about nutrition and health uh, for the Washington Post, for Scientific American, Discover Magazine. So this was something I was really working on in my professional life. So reading tons of studies, you know, and writing articles on how to eat healthy, uh, how to keep our bodies young. And uh, at the same time, you know, in my private life, I was very much interested in how to live healthy as well, especially since I became a parent eight years ago. I really wanted my daughter, you know, to be as healthy as possible. You know, I think most parents have this kind of dream of making sure that children, you know, live the longest and the healthiest possible. So I went the usual ways, maybe a little bit overboard, I have to admit. I was, you know, pureeing all the organic best <laughs> miracle foods, the heritage tomatoes and organic broccoli and kale. And I was sprinkling chia seeds on over my daughter's foods, you know, whenever I could, adding turmeric and all this stuff just to make sure, you know, that everything was perfect and that she would stay healthy. And at the same time at, at work, you know, I started coming across more and more research that was actually pointing in a very different direction, especially one meta-analysis of studies I read, then meta-analysis, this kind of golden standard of research where scientists put together all the research that was done before on a particular topic and come to a kind of conclusion, what is it pointing towards? And um, this meta-analysis showed that Although diet and exercise are indeed very important, things like social integration, so whether you have friends, how, the quality of your marriage, whether you know your neighbors, for instance, if you're connected to your community, matters far more for our health and longevity. So for example, to show you some numbers, the he healthy, usual healthy stuff, so the diet and exercise, their impact on lowering our mortality risk is about 20 to 30%, which is a lot. 
But when you think about the social integration can lower your mortality risk by 65%. So we had 20, 30, and 65 here, which is actually even more than quitting smoking if you smoke two packets of cigarettes per day. So this is huge. So it really stopped me in my tracks. And I was like, okay, am I doing, you know, the best I can to make sure that my family is healthy or I'm just following, you know, blindly the main trends? And, and I, so I started researching and after reading over 600 research papers and talking to dozens of scientists um, and writing Growing Young, I came to a conclusion that I wasn't, I was putting too much effort into this turmeric and all this kind of heritage, you know, organic broccoli, uh, whereas I was completely abandoning the soft drivers of health. So our social integration, kindness, optimism, you know, basically our mental habits and how the huge role they play in our health and longevity. That's incredible. I had never heard that statistic before. And that really does put things in perspective. 20% versus, what'd you say, 60, 65%? 65. And the total kind of pain is 65. <laughs> yeah, that is insane. And it actually reminds me, my grandfather-in-law, who's actually 93, and he does have a very generally healthy diet and he exercises, he does yoga, he does meditation. But he also, you know, he's not very strict with it. And he's always telling me, like, if we're eating out, he's like, you know, you don't have to rearrange the menu, just order whatever you want. He's ordering French toast, he's drinking soda, he's having dessert after every meal. And he's in perfect health for a 93 year old. And, you know, when I ask him, like, what's his secret to health and happiness, he'll say family. And he is, he's really the patriarch of this whole family. And everyone, we go on vacation together every year, sometimes multiple times a year. Everyone's very connected and calling and family and community is such a huge part of his life. And I really do think that is what has helped him get to this place where he's 93 and you could have a conversation with him about anything. You could, you know, he could probably out, uh, you know, yoga you any day. And yeah, so it's... Um, it's really interesting to just to hear a little bit of the science behind it. So yeah, maybe why don't we unpack the three of these main topics? Let's start first with relationships. So what should we know about that? What did you learn about relationships, you know, while you were researching your book? I mean, so the first thing I wanted to tackle maybe here is that, you know, sometimes when I talk about those topics, people ask me, you know, isn't it some kind of new agey stuff? You know, it does sound new agey, right? You know, be happy, connect with other people. But the thing is, it's there is nothing new agey about it. It's, it's pure science. And really, there are so many research papers on this. And they have been done, you know, animal studies, uh, studies on the level of um, epigenetics, genetics, you know, cell, cellular level studies, also epidemiological studies, all the different types of studies that have been you know, it started more or less in the 70s that researchers have been really starting to research that. And there are thousands of studies on that. So there is nothing new age. It's really very biological. And it makes perfect sense because, you know, when you think about it, uh, we are social animals, right? Uh, we are social apes, just like our cousins, chimpanzees we evolved to be in a tribe. We didn't evolve to live in our little tiny apartments on our own. We didn't. We evolved to live in a tribe. And our bodies function the best when we are surrounded by others. And uh, this is how we feel safe, basically. This, in a way, it all boils, boils down to feeling safe. So you have uh, this different stress axis in your body. So for example, one of them is the so-called HPA axis. Um, and this is something that we often call the flight or fight response. So, you know, when you get stressed, there is a cascade of hormones that starts, you know, first your brain activates hypothalamus in your brain, sends signal down to your pituitary glands. And you have this cocktail of hormones, including cortisol, the, the famous stress hormone that gets released. Then this kind of systems, as well as other that release adrenaline, for example, they function the best when we are with other people, when we are feeling safe and connected, uh, whereas when we are feeling alone or rejected by other people, ostracized, this is starting to malfunction. And, um, and with all the downstream health effects for cardiovascular health, for diabetes, uh, even for cancer, you know, whether you, cancer, your cancer will progress or not, it all depends on that. There is also, we have also so-called social hormones. So this is uh, oxytocin, serotonin, vasopressin, endorphins. These are all hormones that have a to connect the way we 
function socially with how our body functions. So for example, you might have heard of oxytocin, so this famous love hormone. And on one hand, it makes us feel all warm and fuzzy, for example, when we are very friends or with our family, you know, we're feeling connected. Um, so we feel the love, you could say. But on the other hand, it has very strictly biological effects on our body. So for example, oxytocin uh, has inflama- anti-inflammatory effects. It has uh, it promotes bone growth, uh, potentially preventing osteoporosis. So these are very, very biological effects. The same for serotonin, for example. In, it impacts liver health directly. Endorphins are natural painkillers. So these things, on one hand, you know, act to connect you to other people, regulate your feelings in a way, but on the other are strictly biological effects on the body. And this is how it's all interconnected. There is also your gut microbiota that also connects your feelings with your health and how you're socially connected with other people. You know, for example, we exchange microbes with other people around you, so with your family, with your friends. This is so interconnected and very, very biological. So sorry for a little bit of digression here, <laughs> but I had, okay. to, I had to put it straight. So so yes, we've mentioned, you know, uh, family, friends. So the most important thing, if you wanted to find what's the number one thing you could be do, doing for your health is a committed, happy, romantic relationship. In general, in research, it means marriage, but of course it doesn't have to be marriage per se, it ha- but it has to be committed. So if you are in a relationship, even long term, but you don't know where it's going, that's not what we are talking about here. It has to be really, really committed. You know you are in it for for good. You are there for each other. And uh, in general, for women, it has to be a happy relationship. Bizarrely, for men, any marriage or committed relationship is good for their health, even if it's not very happy. Well, it's supposedly, it's still a little bit of a mystery, but uh, researchers are suggesting that it's probably because women organize social lives of families. So when men are married, even though the marriage may not be best but the women are providing this kind of contact with family making sure everybody hangs out together you know organizing social life inviting friends so men profit from this part of marriage maybe not from the you know relationship itself but from the social aspect of it so yes but for us women uh, (laughs) happiness in the relationship is very important so yes marriage is number one number two would be family and friends they can be replaced so for example if you don't have i don't know siblings the, the research shows that having friends is perfect replacement. So it doesn't have to be one or the other. Of course, if you have the more, the better. But in general, either friends, family, just having people close to you in whom you can confide, you know, they are there for you. If you fall sick, somebody will bring you soup kind of thing. And this is something also extremely important. The third layer is the wider community. So knowing your neighbors, participating in local events, just being connected in general, you know, having colleagues at work that you chat over coffee, you know, things like that, just being connected basically. Yeah, well, that's so interesting about the relationship and the difference between men and women. I'm curious, did you come across at any point any, whether it's data or anecdotes or stories of how, I don't know, a relationship had improved some sort of outcome or or just benefited someone in, in some way? I mean, I don't have particular stories of any individual people, but uh, definitely there is just so much research on it showing that people who are married have better cardiovascular health, they have lower risk of diabetes, they have lower risk of cancer, they even respond better to flu vaccination. So, you know, now we are <laughs> all told to vaccinate for flu. If you're happily in a happy romantic relationship, you are you have a better chances of responding, of your immune system responding better to the vaccine and protecting you. So there are so many different effects in, in here. So, yeah, so it's really fascinating when you think about it, you know, people, when we are in a couple, we basically synchronize our bodies on extremely physiological level. So from things like our heart rate, for example, our blood pressure, our our electrical skin conductance, you know, the real weird things that we synchronize with our romantic partners. So it's really very biological and, uh, and it's very important for our health. And we synchronize even with other people that we're with. Like I, I read that like women, for example, with women are together quite often, like their cycles actually sync. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we do. That's fascinating, you know, and the same with the gut microbiota I've mentioned before, right? When you touch other people, for example, even when you do contact sports, the teams exchange their skin bacteria, right? And so, so it's absolutely fascinating. And there is also some research showing that for now it's research on mice, but it probably applies to humans too, that uh, the more diverse your relationships, the more diverse 
your gut microbes and it's as something that's actually good for your health so having a diverse network of friends would be you know good for your gut health it's absolutely fascinating how it's all interconnected and how biological we are you know we kind of think now we are over zoom that we can just kind of go all into the cloud and so that's perfectly fine but there is so much research showing that no we need the actual physical side of it you know even the touch right when you touch other people you hold hands or just hug it releases the oxytocin the laugh hormone and without it it's not the same right oh, yeah no definitely you know the internet and zoom and and all of this modern stuff it's just it's a great thing like now especially during this you know pandemic we can stay connected but it's just not the same as being in person so I'm curious for you, after you have done all the research and uh, on this, ha- did you change anything in your life, in your relationships, anything that you started doing that you weren't doing before? I mean, certainly. So I'm less obsessive about my food. So, you know, <laughs> I don't spend gazillion dollars anymore in uh, health food stores as I used before. We still eat very healthy in my family, but I will not be obsessing about exactly organic kale with chia seeds. I will just make some carrot and cabbage and it's perfectly fine. As long as, you know, there is one quote I really love from Michael Pollan. He said, just eat food mostly plants, not too much. And it's, it's kind of simple, right? And, and the truth is that healthy eating is kind of simple. Just eat your vegetables and fruits, not too much junk food, and you'll be fine. But I put much more effort into our social lives. And um, so I run. I run almost every day. But, but, and before the coronavirus crisis, I was planning to run another health marathon. But then I realized, you know, that if I were to prepare for it, I would have to spend kind of a lot of time running by myself. And uh, knowing the research already that, that went into growing young, I realized that even from my health perspective, it's better for me not to run the health marathon, but spend more time sitting on the couch with my husband and having, you know, just chats with him. And still you know do my regular you know five mile runs four times a week that's perfectly enough very good for my health but the health marathon actually could be worse for my health because i would lose the connection because of all the time right it's it's, you know if you have time for everything it's perfect but i don't so i have to make choices and before if i made such a decision i would feel guilty a little bit about it like you know i was sitting on the couch with a glass of wine talking to my husband i'll be like okay it's very nice but you know i'm kind of not running i'm not exercising i should be doing something else but now i know that actually even for my health it's probably better and another thing is that i realized about health is uh, because there's something the very powerful connection between conscientiousness so this personality traits conscientiousness and health so you know the keeping your desk tidy paying your bills on time showing to meetings on time actually one researcher i talked with he said that if conscientiousness could be a pill it would be the most powerful drug on the planet it's so important for our health. So, you know, before I, I said I'm a mom and I, I have an eight-year-old daughter and I always make sure, you know, she eats her vegetables and all this stuff. But now I also realize that the messiness in her room, which is a permanent feature, is actually a health problem as well. And it's not not only because of the Legos you can step on, but actually because conscientiousness, so, you know, kind of keeping your room tidy is so important for health. And the research shows that the earlier you start, even with children, it actually has, you know, effects later in your life. So now I'm really trying to chase her and make sure that she, you know, she's a little bit more conscientious and cleans that room because it's important for her health as well, just as much as eating carrots or apples and so on and so on. Yeah, it's so interesting, all of these things. And I'm going to use that next time my husband asks me to go for a run and I don't feel like it. I'm going to be like, no, let's just sit on the couch. It's better. <laughs> So what about optimism? Optimism, that's sort of the second key feature of the book. I know I feel sometimes, obviously, we all want to be optimistic and think positively. But I I feel like there's always some pushback on that. Like sometimes people are like, oh, you can't just think yourself happier. You can't just, you know, positive thoughts. It doesn't really change things. So I'd love to hear your take on that. And why is optimism so important? What can it do for us? I mean, so there are two things here. So definitely optimism is extremely important for health. So it can add you anywhere from four to 10 years of life. So it's huge. 
there was, for example, one really fascinating research done on nuns, Catholic nuns, that showed that those who, in their diaries, they were using the more kind of optimistic, upbeat language, they lived 10 years longer than those nuns who were using more gloomy language. And, you know, nuns are amazing to study because they, you know, they all wake up at the same hour, they eat the same stuff, they do exactly the same stuff over their days. So if some of them live 10 years longer, this is a huge difference, right? And it was the same studies were done also on uh, famous psychologists, uh, on other groups of people as well, showing exactly that from four to 10 years, you can get from being optimistic. And yes, you know, there's also lots of research by now showing that you can become more optimistic by just basically changing your thought patterns. On the other hand, you know, maybe the criticism you hear or kind of people kind of, you know, reacting the way you said to you telling them that they should be more optimistic is that optimism is just part of it. So there is also maybe they're also confusing optimism with kind of hedonic happiness. So just kind of enjoying, you know, this kind of hedonic pleasures. And um, the truth is that the kind of pushing to be happy, this is not what we are talking about. So optimism is kind of like a personality trait, something similar to a personality trait. That's uh, just basically how you see the world, how you react to what's happening to you. But it doesn't mean you are chasing happiness. Like, I have to be happy today. Can I, it's not about that. It's just kind of how you see what's happening to you, right? And there is a second side to it. So it's something called eudaimonic happiness. So this kind of purpose in life and being happy, not because of the hedonic pleasures, because, you know, I had a bubble bath or just made myself happy, you know, having a party or something like this, but uh, having meaning and purpose. And this kind of happiness derived from having some meaningful goals and connection and stuff, this really impacts your health as well. And is extremely important, even on a cellular level, you know, studies show that it changes your gene expression, even genes related to your immune system, which, you know, it's kind of important these days for our immune systems. So it's very, very important. So on one hand, you know, your thought patterns, and on the other hand, having meaning and purpose and this kind of, some kind of important goals that you feel you're working towards, which are extremely important for for your longevity. Yeah. And with optimism, it's definitely, it's that, you know, even when things are going bad, you choose to look on the brighter side of things. Because I I do feel it is easier for us and even society-wise with all the news that we're constantly hearing, it's always the bad news. It's always the worst (laughs) that's going on in the world. And there's a lot of fear-mongering and just drama, right? And so I feel like we get trained to kind of look at the negative. And I even, you know, there's people in my life who's like, oh, it's raining. It's like such a gloomy day. I don't want to do anything. And it's like, you don't want to let these outside forces, something like the weather, which you have zero control over, dictate your feelings because you're, you're never going to really be happy, right? There's always going to be something kind of blocking it. So it's just a matter. And I think it takes practice. I'm curious for you, were you always optimistic? Were you optimistic before you wrote the book and did the research or was it after? Like, how did you become an optimistic person? I mean, generally, you know, part of it is genetic, that's for sure. I think I was, you know, definitely was born optimistic, but uh, genes are just part of the story. So just like with a lot of things about our bodies and minds, you know, we can still work on it. So there are some great books out there, you know, how to become more optimistic. And uh, this is basically, again, about training your thought patterns. So I read those books, but it was already a while ago, even before I wrote Growing Young. So, and these are really great ways to just train yourself exactly to just, you you know, you catch yourself, you exactly look out the window, you say, oh my God, what a horrible weather. And you catch yourself, you know, at this point, you know, is it really horrible? And maybe, you know, it smells nice because it's been raining and look how nice the air smells, right? So it's, it, there is really a lot about the perspective. And, um, but also, you know, you mentioned the news and definitely, you know, reading a lot of news is not helping anybody become more optimistic in journalism. <laughs> That's for sure. <laughs> we, have a, we have a saying in journalism, you know, if it bleeds, it leads. So, you know, it's, there is a reason for that. So it's definitely, you know, you can read those news. That's definitely a great first step to becoming more optimistic. 
Yeah. <laughs> and uh, the second part that you had mentioned, having the purpose. I know in Japan, they have actually a word for this. I believe it's ikigai, where you have this purpose in life. It's the thing that gets you out of bed in the morning. And I think we've all probably experienced this in our lives. It's like, if you feel like you don't know what you're doing, or you don't have your direction, or maybe you haven't you know, figured out your career or whatever that it is, you are less motivated. But once you have that purpose, it's like you jump out of bed in the morning, you want to go to work, you want to do whatever you have to do. And it just it energizes you in a way that no matcha green tea or, you know, anything else, any superfood, you know, just can't do. Oh, yes, certainly. You know, when I was writing Growing Young, I actually went to research the book in Japan, because, you know, Japan is the longest lived nation right now. And uh, when we hear about Japan uh, these days, a lot is about, you know, Okinawa diet, for example, right? So what people in Okinawa are eating, how, what kind of vegetables they're eating, how much salt they're eating, how much, you know, are they eating meat, are they eating fish? And um First of all, Okinawa is not no longer the longevity center of Japan. Now it's uh, the Nagano prefecture. So maybe soon you'll see books like the Nagano diet. These are the mountainous areas of Japan. And um, and I went there and I talked to researchers there and I talked to some centenarians as well. And um, yes, diet is part of it. But when you talk with people in Japan, actually one of the very first things they mention when they talk about health is exactly this ikigai, which is something when in the West that doesn't really appear that much in conversations with longevity researchers. And they see this purpose in life, the ikigai, as such an important part of health that even the health ministry of Japan has officially put it into their health promotion strategy. So they really, really know how important that is. And in this particular prefecture, Nagano, which where people live the longest these days in Japan, they have particularly a lot of this purpose in life when they measure it in studies. And so for them, what it means is this exactly the reason for living. Supposedly, it's difficult to translate exactly the meaning of it, but this is how Western researchers translate it. And when I talk to people in Japan, they usually mention things like caring for my family, for example, caring for my grandchildren, or beautifying my community. So for example, gardening my front garden so the street looks beautiful for everybody. Things like that, right? So it doesn't have to be something enormous. Of course, you know, you can be, your ikigai can be trying to stop the climate change. That's great. But it doesn't have to be either. It can be something smaller, you know, helping my neighbors, you know, helping my children, you know, your work as well, right? Right. In Japan, actually, another thing interested, interesting that I visited, there are, they have silver hair employment agencies. And these are employment agencies for retired people, or however bizarrely that sounds. So when the Japanese retire from their regular careers, they can go to this specialized employment agencies where they get usually part-time jobs that are very easy and don't require a lot of you know mind power or concentration or anything like this and they get them not for the money but for exactly for ikigai for being connected to the community for doing something for giving something back for having a purpose so there will be for example gardening public spaces or helping children cross on the way to school jobs like that and a lot of people do that and again in this Nagano prefecture there is a particularly high number of people who do this kind of silver hair jobs and I'm absolutely not saying you know there are also cultural differences that we you know in the west should all keep working until we drop but definitely finding something you know it can be volunteering can be exactly helping your neighbors or your job can be that or there are so many other ways that you can feel that your life has some kind of meaning and purpose and this is really really important for health it's so interesting i love how you explained it because i feel like when i've traditionally seen it in let's say online media outlets talking about ikigai it's very tightly, or they're talking about it really solely in terms of your work, like your mm -hmm. job, your career. They never mention the like taking care of your grandkids or taking care of the garden so that your community looks nice. And I think mm -hmm. I'm so glad that you said that because for someone who's not working, right? And I think that sometimes our worth is so tied to our career or how much money we're making that if you're not making the top salary or you don't have the top spot on the corporate ladder, you feel less than in some way. But I yeah. love that Ikigai is not just, you know, your career, it's just your purpose in life and how you fit into that community. 
I would say this has actually absolutely nothing to do with the corporate ladder. You know, you can you can be at the very top of the corporate ladder and making the most money. You have no ikigai because you you know money is not ikigai. So making more money is not that. Being successful in your job is also not that. It's always about giving something back. So somebody really at the bottom of the corporate ladder ha- can have much more meaning than somebody at the very top if they believe their jobs are important. So there was this absolutely fascinating study about hospitals cleaning stuff. Whereas um, when the researchers kind of manipulated the way people experience their jobs and they could see that if people saw their job just as a cleaning job, and I'm just a cleaner, they, they really were kind of feeling unmotivated and down and not really, you know, very uplifted by it. But if they saw their job in a kind of greater perspective as having meaning, it changed everything. So for example, other cleaners in the hospital saw their job as extremely vital to keeping the hospital working and saving lives because if they didn't clean properly, there could be some kind of infections, you know, the hospital, dirty hospital, it's, you know, people can die because of the dirty hospital. So if they saw their cleaning job as saving lives, that changed everything. Thing, right? It's just a perspective. It's still the same. You're still cleaning toilets. But if you see it that way, it's huge, right? So even, you know, you may not be cleaning a hospital, but maybe you're even cleaning some kind of corporate offices. You can see it that way. Let's say they are making some product you believe in and you're making it better for the people who work here to make this product or whatever, right? You really can change your perspective. So you really don't have to be at the top earning, making some huge career at all. You know, it can be even destructive. You know, there is so much research showing that when people make more money, they're actually less empathetic. And empathy is another extremely important thing I talk in, about in Growing Young because it's a basis of all the connection. And not only it can affect our health directly on a physiological level, empathy, but also because it improves our relationships, it boosts our kindness, volunteering, charitable giving, you know. And so it's, it's really, really important. So money can just be the structure. Yeah, for sure. I just love that explanation. So you you mentioned empathy. Let's talk about kindness. That's the third key of the book. So talk about kindness and where does that play a role? How does that, you know, I'd love to hear about the research where kindness can actually impact our, our well-being. Yes. So, you know, kindness and, you know, there are different ways to be kind, right? So you can be volunteering, which there is lots of research showing that people who volunteer, they spend less time in hospitals, they live longer, they have lower risk of diabetes, for example. You can be donating money and it also works to boost your health. Or you can just be doing everyday kindness, right? Just being a kind person and just simple random act of kindness. And there is uh, even research showing that it can affect your body on a level of the white cells in your blood. So when the researchers, you know, randomized people, some were doing acts of kindness and others were just, you know, not doing them. So those who were who are performing acts of kindness, their leukocytes, so the white blood cells, had different gene expression of those people who didn't do the acts of kindness. So it's really, really very physiological. And I, I actually saw it on myself as well. For writing Growing Young, I did this kind of experiment on myself with uh, collaboration from scientists from King's College London. And what we've done is that um, we devised a kind of a, an experiment based on large-scale real experiments where... For seven days, I had to measure my cortisol levels by chewing on this kind of cortisol swabs that collect your saliva in the morning, in the afternoon, and in the evening for seven days. And on three of those days, randomly chosen, I engaged in a lot of kindness. So I'll sit in the morning and think, you know, how can I be kind today? So, you know, I, I baked cookies for my husband to take to work. I brought some chocolates for our library lady. You know, I cleaned some trash in our neighborhood. I put a sticky note with a happy smiley face in my neighbor's car, you know, just small things like that, you know. And not only it felt really good just planning, it was just really pleasurable and fun to just think about all the nice things you can do. But afterwards, when the scientists at King's College London, when they analyzed my levels of cortisol, they noticed that on the days when I was doing the kindness, the cortisol slopes because the cortisol you know, behaves in a certain way throughout the day. So it starts high, then it drops. And the way it drops, it really tells you a lot about your stress levels and how healthy your stress response is, they could really see that on those days, my stress response was much, much healthier, much better than on all the other days, even though one of my kindness days was very stressful for me for personal reasons. And yet my body didn't respond to that stress in this kind of toxic way. My cortisol was still behaving much better 
most likely because of all the kindness I was doing, which other, you know, much larger scale proper studies actually show. But it was fascinating to see it, you know, on the actual graphs and actual numbers on my own body. Yeah, so lesson there is when you're having a bad day, still be nice. <laughs> be nice to people, exactly. bake someone some cookies. <laughs> <laughs> Even more, the more stressed you are, the more kind you should be because it's good for your, you know, for your stress. <laughs> Is there anything that, and what about philanthropy? Say, for example, does giving money have the same effect as time? So it's not the same effect. It's also good for you. It also helps. But if you were to choose giving time or giving money, giving time is always better. So between those two, choose time. But it's better to donate money than to do anything. And donating money also has positive uh, health effects. So, you know, don't choose, okay, I will not volunteer. I'm just donating money. So if you do this choice, it's, it's worse for you, but it's still better than nothing. And if you do it on top, then it's, you know, extra boost. And uh, there are even fascinating studies showing that it can even affect how strong your muscles are. So for example, when researchers ask people to kind of try themselves with holding some kind of heavy weight before and after they were donated some money, after donating money, you can actually hold a heavy weight longer than if you don't donate money. It kind of gives you the, some kind of muscle strength kind of sounds weird, but it actually does work on a physiological level as well. So, um, so yes, so, donating money works too, but uh, choose time, it's better. Donate before a race or any sort of athletic uh, feat. Yeah, it could work. It's only <laughs> a, a new work. hack. <laughs> it's, exactly, it's perfectly legal. So. Yeah. <laughs> so now that, you know, we're living in these COVID times and much of the world is going into lockdown, right? What tips or what advice would you give people? How can we maintain these connections and relationships, stay optimistic, stay kind when the world feels like it's ending sometimes? I mean, I think these things are even more important now than before because exactly where I think we're stressed, we are, you know, our health is even more in challenge. So, you know, there are some very simple tips and very, you know, precise ones. For example, if you are to connect with somebody else, choose calling over texting. There is actual research showing that if you text someone, you don't have the same oxytocin, so this love hormone boost, as if you hear their voice. So getting exactly the same message with a voice call gives you more powerful oxytocin boost than getting exactly the same words over text. So choose calling over texting. That's one. And of course, probably video is even more powerful, although there is no, there are no studies yet on that, but I would guess that seeing the other person is even better. And um, generally, you know, work on your connections. It's still possible if you are, of course, if you're locked down on your own, then it's a little bit harder. But if you are locked down with your family, for example, with your spouse, with your children, put extra effort in those relationships, you know, give them extra hugs, look them directly into their eyes. You know, it gives you this, exactly, it gives you the oxytocin, serotonin boost, the social hormones that uh, not only improve your relationships, but also improve your health. Doing things together. So there is fascinating research on synchrony. So when we, for example, you know, this, do this kind of synchronous dancing, like Macarena type of dancing or flash mob type of dancing, or singing together, it actually gives us even more, it doubles the output of endorphins, for instance. So these hormones that give you the runner's high, but also our natural pancreas, for example. So dance together, sing together, you know, just do things together. And also, you know, maybe this time can give you more chance to think about things exactly like purpose in life. You know, there is this amazing quote by Nietzsche that I actually have here on my on my wall that says that he who has a why to live can bear almost any how. So you know, no matter how tough the times get, if you have a purpose, it makes things easier. And there is already research on coronavirus and purpose in life. It was done in Germany. It shows that people who do have purpose in life actually suffer much less stress and much less mental adverse health effects of coronavirus lockdowns than those who don't have purpose in life. So really try to think about it, you know, just what gives you the meaning? What can be your purpose in life? And just thinking about it can realize that you already have one, for, for instance, but just take time to think about it. Yeah, those are all great tips. And I think the important takeaway here with the purpose, I just I know from I've done a couple different episodes on this and just hearing from people, I think sometimes it stresses people out to figure out their purpose because they feel like they have, okay, what is the one thing that I have to do? And uh, if you don't know, like if you don't have a strong calling towards something, it could make you feel worse. But realizing that your purpose 
maybe at this point in time is just to beautify your community or to, uh, you know, make art or to take care of your kids or whatever it is, that might be your, your icky guy. So don't feel like you have to come up with this, you know, grand, uh, you know, thing. (laughs) Yeah. So, um, so that's really helpful. The Japanese people I talked with, you know, the the centenarians and, and the ninety and eighty year olds, uh, they're actually their ikigais guys were exactly surprisingly low key. You know, for most people, it was their family or their community. You know, just really really small things. Actually, I don't think anybody mentioned some, you know, save the polar bears or anything like this. Like, or just anything huge. It was really kind of very small, but still gave them this kind of feeling that there is something they're living for. And it was always about giving back. So, right. So for example, one time during one interview, somebody asked me, is golfing, can golfing be my ikigai? Because it kept me, you know, uh, it gets me out of bed in the morning. So unfortunately, I confirmed with some researchers I talked recently, but they said, no, golfing doesn't work. It has to be something, unless you use golf to somehow, you know, improve the lives of others. But in general, it has to be some kind of giving back to other people. So one last question that I like to ask all my guests, if you can leave our listeners with just one tip or one piece of advice on how they can live a happier and healthier life, what would that be? Well, just one thing. Just one. (laughs) Okay, so uh, commit time to spending to your relationships, you know, like the way we put time in our, in our apps, I don't know, to make sure we exercise or that we do the 10,000 steps a day or just make sure to put into your calendar, you know, spend time with my spouse, spend time with my friends, just make sure to to find time. I love it. Well, thank you so much. I really love this episode. If you guys want to check out the book, it's called Growing Young, How Friendship, Optimism and Kindness Can Help You Live to 100. It's available on Amazon, wherever books are sold. I will link to it. And where else can people find you? So you can check the book's website is www.growingyoungthebook.com and you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at uh, mzaraska, so that's Z-A-R-A-S-K-A. And yes, and you can connect with me there. Awesome. Thank you so much, Marta. Thank you.